Britain's Prime Minister has returned to work, vowing to lead from the front in the fight against coronavirus. Boris Johnson was diagnosed with the virus a month ago and spent three days in intensive care. In his first speech since leaving hospital, he says the UK is starting to turn the tide in tackling the outbreak. Johnson's pledged his government will outline plans for easing restrictions, but he's warning of the risk of a second wave. John Hull is joining us live from Westminster in central London. John, the tone of the Prime Minister's message was very much a rallying call. What's he been saying? Yes, a rallying call, trying to bring the public with him, trying to display a new sort of sense of openness in the face uh, of persistent criticisms in his absence, both of his and his government's handling of this crisis. Well, Britain has its Prime Minister back. Uh, he left ICU intensive care two weeks ago, remember, suffering from uh, COVID-19, the disease having come fairly close by his own admission to taking his own life. Uh, he's now back at number 10 Downing Street, back at work and facing a complex set of issues that he's got to deal with. First of all, those criticisms, of course, also persistent shortages of uh, uh, PPE, personal protective equipment for people on the front line, the healthcare community, uh, the care community, uh, medical workers and so on, and also testing nowhere near the government targets set for the end of this month and that will need to be uh, ramped up vastly if it's to deal with that much feared second uh, wave. But perhaps the most crucial issue and the first thing on his uh, in tray is uh, the these are these calls, these louder and louder calls for clarity, for a way forward on this lockdown. Britain entering its fifth, fifth week of restrictive measures now. Calls coming from far and wide about how it will be eased, when it will be eased, what are the measures that will need to be put in place in order for the lockdown to be eased. And Boris Johnson having to find a new tone, a new form of language, I think, to communicate with the public to make sure that he brings them along with him and the government now in what is to come. And that, I think, began in the last hour or two outside Downing Street uh, with those words, with that speech. He uh, highlighted the positive, first of all, in this, the greatest challenge, he said, six, since the Second World War. He talked about real progress being made, the NHS, the health service here, not in fact being overwhelmed as many had feared. He talked about uh, the beginning of the country turning the tide. But, he said, to those desperately looking for signs that the lockdown was going to be eased any time soon, now, he said, is not the time because of the fear of a second wave, a second spike that, he said, could be even more disastrous for the country and for the economy. Contain your impatience, he said, as we reach the end of the first phase of the this conflict. Here's what he had to say. If this virus were a physical assailant, an unexpected and invisible mugger, which I can tell you from personal experience it is, then this is the moment when we have begun together to wrestle it to the floor. I know it is tough and I want to get this economy moving as fast as I can, but I refuse to throw away all the effort and the sacrifice of the British people and to risk a second major outbreak and huge loss of life and the overwhelming of the NHS. Yeah, Jonah, these are obviously very strong words from the Prime Minister, but the hard work begins now, doesn't it? Because we're still faced with the UK in a very, very difficult situation. Well, the UK has reached uh, its peak of the epidemic, according to the scientific community. That peak was hit sometime in the first, around the first week uh, of April, but it hasn't seen the rapid decline that many might have hoped for. Uh, it is still passing through the peak, the decline that has happened in terms of new infections, hospital admissions and so on has been disappointingly slow, according to the scientific community. And the great worry is that if you ease these restrictions now, and there are signs that the public are beginning to get restless with the nature of this lockdown, and particularly the sort of vacuum of information that many perceive to be uh, going on here, not knowing quite what it is any longer that they're working towards, quite what benchmarks are to be set, quite what they need to 
to be looking for on the horizon. Well, as that restlessness continues, the worry will be that people unilaterally start breaking the lockdown. And the scientific community's concern is that if they do that now, the systems simply are not in place to prepare, to guard against, to control uh, a second wave. Testing is only now beginning to be ramped up. It was only last week that the government announced plans, uh, concrete plans, for testing contact, uh, testing and contact tracing, which is the vital uh, sort of mechanism that needs to be in place in order to control that second wave and prevent another enormous uh, death toll. So they're not in a position to ease the lockdown. The public want them to ease the lockdown. This is a massive problem for the government. It's something Boris Johnson is going to have to tackle head on, and he will have to tackle it, it more than anything else, perhaps, with soothing, reassuring language that allows people to believe that he's back in control, that he is taking this as seriously as it can possibly be taken, and that all the measures that need to be taken are being put in place. That update from John Hull, live for us in Westminster in London. John, thanks very much indeed. Well, the Prime Minister has made no mention of the various criticisms of him and his government, the ones that Jonah was mentioning. To recap, medics across the country say supplies of personal protective equipment, or PPE, has been insufficient. The target of 100,000 tests per day has not been met. Britain actually tested fewer than 29,000 people in the past day. As concerned, the death toll is likely to be far higher. Government numbers refer only to hospital deaths, but do not include deaths in the community and in care homes. Coronavirus has now claimed more than 20,700 lives in UK hospitals, with more than 152,000 confirmed cases. Maya Goodfellow is a political journalist, and she's an author, and she's joining us now from London. Thanks very much indeed uh, for being with us. Jonah there was saying that it is up to the Prime Minister to pr uh, present a very strong and firm grip on the country. But do you think that's going to be enough to satisfy his critics? No, I think there's actually a major problem here. There is a big disconnect between Boris Johnson's tone, but also the content of his speech, and what is actually happening in the UK. So he talked about the pe people looking at the UK as an apparent success in relation to coronavirus. But actually, we, has, at the moment, have one of the worst death rates in the world, as you've said, and 20,000, more than 20,000 deaths in hospital. And that figure seems to be much higher if you take into account deaths in the community and deaths in care homes. And, you know, these are not just figures on a, on a sheet. These are human beings. These are people across the country who will have lost their family, their loved ones, and who will be mourning for them at this very moment. And I think it's quite insulting for Boris Johnson to take this tone, to not mention PPE shortages, to not mention the crisis in our social care system, to not even engage with where there may be any failures in these criticisms of government. And what I'd also say is he used this analogy of the virus being something like a, a physical assailant. He talked about it as being this invisible and unexpected mugger. And um, as well as really disliking this kind of macho language that I find quite unhelpful, it's also inaccurate. This was not unexpected insofar as the UK had a bigger lead time than many other countries in the world, more time to prepare for this. And it seems that government has not done that, has not followed WHO advice in terms of testing, tracing, and then isolating. And, you know, for a lot of public workers, frontline workers, whether that be people in supermarkets, NHS staff, care workers, people working in our schools, it is upsetting, I think, to hear the Prime Minister talk like this, as if their experiences in their day-to-day -day isn't happening at all. And I would say that it's only a few weeks ago that Abdul Chowdhury, an NHS doctor, was desperately pleading for PPE and then died from coronavirus. There is a big disconnect here between how the Prime Minister is talking and what's actually happening. And I think government needs to engage with these criticisms, not just for criticism's sake, but to learn from it and to respond to those criticisms. Early on in, this, uh, in the spread of this virus in the UK, uh, the approval rating for the government and for Boris Johnson was actually fairly high. People were fairly pleased with the way they were handling this. Given everything that's happened subsequently, how do you think this is going to play out politically for Johnson when he Eventually, the virus does become under control. I think so far, some of the opinion polls, there was one in the Observer newspaper yesterday that suggested actually people's confidence in the government had massively decreased. And I think as people get to grips with the ins and outs of what has happened here, there will be some serious questions to ask about government, not least because 
hundreds of thousands of people across the country are being affected by this in one way or another. But also there are some key things that they haven't done and that they've remained really quiet on despite being asked by campaigners and by other politicians about what they're doing. So, for instance, in the area of immigration enforcement, they haven't suspended the hostile environment, although migrants are able to use the NHS if they are suspected of having coronavirus symptoms and aren't, aren't going to be charged in any way. The hostile environment has kind of seeped into our public services. And so what it means for many people, the fact that it's still in play, is that they're scared to access healthcare. So we're hearing reports that people who are migrants are dying from coronavirus after having been too scared to seek medical advice. And so there's a serious question to ask about the government's handling of this that I think will continue to be asked in the coming weeks and I don't think should be overlooked for, um, for fear of seeming to politicise this. Actually, I think there are big questions to be asked, and I think many members of the public are going to want to have those questions answered. Maya Goodfellow, we appreciate you taking the time to join us in Al Jazeera. Thank you very much indeed.